Hi, I'm Julie Sweetland from the Frameworks Institute. Thanks for tuning in to the third episode of our online video series, exploring research findings and framing recommendations from the Farming and Food Narrative Project. In this video, I'll be walking through our findings on how the public thinks about farming and food and what that means for communicators seeking to shift attitudes towards sustainability and sustainable approaches to agriculture. I am drawing in this video on the research presented in this report, The Landscape of Public Thinking About Farming, published in 2019. Um, and it's about mental models, and we dig into um, researching mental models because changing mental models is the key to changing systems. So this diagram from our friends at the Social Change Consultancy, FSG, illustrates six conditions of systems change. It says that, of course, to change a system, you have to work on the things you can see in operation every day. Uh, at the top level, the policies that govern what a system does and doesn't do, the practices that are enacted within a system, and the resources, the money, the people, the information that flow through a system. But to get to true transformation, you have to dig deeper down to the root of this triangle. You have to get beneath the surface and address the ways of thinking that hold a problem in place. And that's why at Frameworks, we conduct original research to uncover and analyze those mental models. Um, so sometimes I'll say cultural models, sometimes I'll say mental models, they're essentially the same thing. Uh, they have these characteristics. Number one, they are widely shared, assumed patterns of thinking that shape how we make sense of the world and what we do. Typically, they have been around for a long time. Um, and the second image here or icon, there are multiple models on any given issue. And we can think of these models as productive or unproductive, depending on whether they are helpful for our goals or not. And finally, um, they are structuring. They are sparked by the process of association and once at, like at the top of the tree there, and once activated, they shape people's thinking and opinions. They can send them in one way or another. And that means that the way we frame an issue can call up productive models and background unproductive ones, which gives us a reliable, predictable way to influence public thinking. As I described in greater detail in the previous episode about methods, at Frameworks we uncover mental models by conducting a cognitive analysis of interviews with ordinary members of the public, so people who aren't experts. I'm going to give you a peek into some of those interviews in the video that follows. It has been edited so that you can see the patterns in public thinking, ideas that come up again and again. Let's listen in. What comes to mind for you when you think about farming? Food. 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 Fresh vegetables. Corn. Soybeans. Corn. Animals. Animals. Cattle. Cattle. Tractors. Farm equipment. Tractors. House in the distance. I think about land. Rural areas. Large spaces. Open plains and uh, sunshine. Vast you know, acres of land. What types of things do farmers have to make decisions about? What to grow, what they can grow. What crops would be the best thing to grow that year? What are they going to grow? When to plant certain things. When to plant, what to plant, uh, what kind of rotation to use. What kind of crops to plant, how to rotate the crops. Making sure that they have the right necessities that they need to keep their farm running. How much feed is necessary for all the cows I have and all the pigs I have? Water, uh, access to water. Uh, if it's hydrated enough or overly hydrated. Types of vehicles to use to farm. Equipment uh, to prepare the soil and then harvest the crop. Financial is a big one. Wages, um, cost. You gotta figure out if what is like corn prices trading at, you know, what are 
wheat prices. Thinking about, you know, if it's even profitable to still farm. What kinds of things then influence the decisions that farmers make? Probably to be able to support their family and to support their bottom line. Provide for themselves. To provide for their families. To support yourself and support your family. They need to make a living. Where's the demand? How to meet the demand? Financial markets. Uh, I have to study world markets. You know, what the, the world supply of soybeans or corn, etc. is. They have to see part of what's a growing trend among uh, whatever country they are in of what those people expect from their their food what sorts of things would you say are affected or impacted by farming essentially the whole food supply is tied to farming food chain is basic to everything we do everybody's got to eat it helps us provide food where we don't have to rely on other countries for the for the food what we get in our stores to eat what we have access to everything pretty much that we eat i mean our grocery store. Well, uh, definitely prices and the produce that you go and get at the grocery store. The price of uh, food that we're uh, going to eat from the grocery store. If there were no farming, what would we be doing as far as buying groceries in the grocery stores? Our environment is impacted. Um, the, uh, the ecology of that area. Greenhouse effects. Climate change. Maybe the, the climate, like our weather. And how would you say, if at all, should farming change in the U.S.? Tax breaks or something to help them out when when times get hard. I think that farmers should get some type of special tax credit personally. I think it's gotten a lot more difficult for farmers. You know, there's a lot of regulations. I don't think government should be putting restrictions on them. I think they should allow the farmers to make their own restrictions. We need to stop subsidizing the large agribusinesses. We need to stop paying them not to produce. You see all the time where farmers have too much corn, they have to like throw it out and then the government like pays them for that. That's not a very good system. I wish we'd used less kind of Roundup products. Farm more organically. They should try to do things the right way without putting um, different chemicals and things to, to help it grow faster. And more ethical farming or more kind of just smaller farming, but less like factory farming. I would like to see it go back to a little bit more family oriented. I think there's too much big business that's kind of running small farmers out of business. That's really awful. They just got to use more automation, more technology, more um, things to produce more larger crops. Making sure the tools they use are more efficient and um, cost effective. So they will be able to produce more. Larger farms are are uh, more economical. However, uh, the uh, cost of doing it that way is uh, to be supported by all the rest of the uh, population, and it, it would be expensive. There's just so many factors that we're kind of like forced to go along with the government unless we like basically fight and even then it's kind of like what do you do because everyone has to come together it's a uh, issue that you don't really know if it can be fixed um or if there is like a policy or something that can be put in place to fix here if it's just something that has to come from people okay so there is a lot going on there i'm going to try to walk you through uh some of that i really encourage you to, to dive into the report if you uh, found that found that uh, quick tour uh, intriguing. So the first set of models there um, are mental models of food. The most prominent top of mind way that people think about farming is through the lens of food. Farming exists, people reason, to allow us all to eat. Now that's not untrue, but it is problematic for us in some ways. When people equate farming with food production, they want to, to see growing methods they believe yield the best food. And what is that exactly? Well, that's good food equals healthy food. Uh, when people evaluate food, they do so in terms of human health. People reason that good food is food that is good for you, providing maximum nutrition. A second model involves nature and human society is totally distinct. You didn't see as much of this in the video, but it definitely came through in the longer form interviews that we conducted.
People think of natural as untouched by human endeavors, as pure and healthy. And human intervention, on the other hand, pollutes and defiles nature in this way of thinking. Um, so again, these two models aren't wrong or bad per se. Of course, we all want healthy food and it's true that you know whole foods are, um, are healthier for, for humans. Uh, but when it comes to think about thinking about farming, these models work together in ways that limit public understanding and support for sustainable and balanced approaches to crop production. When reasoning from the good food equals healthy food model, people think the primary purpose of farming is to promote consumer health, or at least not harm it. Uh, they say the priority should be protecting and enhancing eaters' health. And they don't think much at all about the health of people who work on farms or any of the other impacts of farming. And then when people look at nature and humanity as distinct and opposing systems, they assume that farming should involve as little human intervention as possible and use few, if any, human-made substances, augmenting grains, fruits, vegetables through technology or synthetic substances. Um, that is seen as not only producing food that's less healthy to eat, but it's dam people see it as damaging to nature and even morally questionable. Uh, and that's just the food itself, you know, forget about the soil, the water, any of that. So this is seen as, as really problematic in this, in this mental model. A third mental model involves the assumption, uh, consumerism. It's the assumption that food is solely a consumer good. Um, from this perspective, the farming, you, you heard all that talk about grocery stores, grocery stores, grocery stores, right? So from this perspective, the farming and food system is assumed to be a free marketplace where farmers simply supply what the market demands. People assume that consumer preference is what determines what gets grown, how much of it is grown, and how it is grown. This leads people to reason that if there are any problems with farming, um, and if you know we're looking around for who's responsible for addressing them, it has little to do with government or the food industry and everything to do with consumer choices. The consumerist model tells us that if we want to support good farming practices, we have to educate ourselves and shop differently. And again, it's not that that's wrong, it's that it's incomplete and then it obscures other, other aspects of what could be happening in society. Within the consumerist model, it's hard for people to see how organizing, voting, or advocating for systems change would make a difference for farming. All right, so if those are mental models of food, we also uncovered mental models of farmers. Uh, when people think about farmers and the work they do, they draw on two models that really oversimplify the issues. So one is hard laborers, farmers work from sunup to sundown, and the other is that farmers are loving and ethical. Farmer, they, here's a quote, that, you know, they do it for the love of the land, the love of the crop. Um, so the hard laborers, laborers model involves a focus on grueling physical labor and demanding hands-on tasks like planting seeds and weeding large fields. And the loving and ethical model assumes that farming is an act of love. P farmers are passionate about feeding the world and so they create food by loving the land and caring for plants and the environment. While both of these models may seem positive at first glance, I think it's more accurate to say that they involve thinking about farmers as exceptional. Um, that means people are thinking of farmers and farm workers as somehow outside of our current cultural norms. And what's more, both of these models oversimplify the work involved in farming. The hard laborers model leads people to underappreciate the skill and expertise that farming requires. The loving and ethical model romanticizes farming and also leads people to focus narrowly on farmers' perceived ethical commitments to doing the right thing. And it draws attention away from the economic, policy, and social factors that support or impede sustainable farming practices. All right, another set of models about farming have to do with the way people think about the relationship between farming and nature. Uh, natural determinism, kind of the idea that farmers are at the mercy of mother nature, 
and an idea of scientific control, the idea that farmers really can fight back through science and technology. All right, so this natural determinism model involves the thinking that farmers are at the mercy of nature, not only weather, but also other aspects of the natural surroundings, such as the soil quality, insects, animals, and people sometimes seem to assume that natural forces almost wholly determine whether a crop succeeds or fails. So it's a very strong and deterministic model. The scientific control model involves the thinking that farmers can use technological and scientific advances to overcome the limits imposed by nature. While people are often skeptical of farming technologies developed by humans, if you think back to the, you know, nature, natural is better than man-made, um, that's true, but they also think of science as a useful tool for controlling nature and improving the quantity and quality of food. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, people can have multiple mental models of kind of the same thing. They can contradict each other. And this is one of the reasons, you know, that we study them is, is in order to be able to uh, leverage them and, and navigate them in our communications. All right, so it, with these two models, we can see again that mental models have productive and unproductive aspects. The natural determinism model rightfully acknowledges that farmers can't fully control natural forces. But on the other hand, it keeps people from recognizing that farmers have and apply significant expertise in managing and enhancing the natural environment. If people don't recognize that farmers do have those strategies to manage complexity, it's hard to get them to engage meaningfully with what it means to use sustainable farming strategies. All right, and what about the scientific control model? Well, this model encourages appreciation for science and technology and farming. It sparks optimism about improving farming and it reduces fatalism about the natural environment. At the same time, it can quickly lead people into thinking about unproductive models of science that it's uh, dangerous or you know is, is going to harm us somehow. All right, so this has implications for the way we frame farming. If we can find ways to activate people's belief that science and tech make farming more effective, but we can do that in a way that we don't activate their assumption that human intervention makes food less safe and less healthy, we can build support for research, innovation, and public investments in forward-looking farming practices. All right, so again, multiple mental models, productive and unproductive aspects, and the way we um, activate them uh, in our communications really shapes how people are gonna think about sustainable agriculture uh, policies and practices. All right, third one, mental models of farming practice. Uh, we found three mental models um, of how people think about what farmers do all day and how they go about farming. Farming is formula, farming is trial and error, and farming as craft. So farming as, as formula, here's a, a quote, you know, it basically all comes down to plant, ten, harvest, repeat, the sense that it's, sure, it's hard work, but it's simple work. It's kind of three steps um, and, and you just need to do it. This model, you know, really obviously obscures the, the complexity of farming practice, the decision making, and anything that's not about the direct crop management, right? Anything that's about uh, you know, labor, business practices, any uh, marketing, uh, food distribution, engaging with other businesses, you know, it really oversimplifies, uh, oversimplifies farming to a significant degree. These other two uh, models of farming practice have a little bit more going for them. One is farm farming as trial and error. The idea that farmers keep trying until they find what works. It's a sense of, of you know, trying, uh, adopting a practice, observing its effects, uh, and tinkering with it, building on it, continuing to work with it. This has much more to do with, you know, farming as an applied science, although it still tends to be a little simplistic. It's kind of like, you know, do we uh, plant in on June 4th or do we plant on June 5th? You know, simple, simple ideas about it. So this is one that we, is productive. We want to build on it. Another uh, models that farming as craft, the sense that farmers use wisdom, insights, you know, practical knowledge, 
passed down through the generations. And again, this model has a lot going for it. It's the sense of uh, farming as, you know, farmers as artisans almost, as masters of a comp complicated um, art. But there's a sense, there's a way where this can kind of go uh, into it, farming as a lost art. Um, or there's a sense that, uh, you know, it's really just about inheriting the knowledge rather than uh, owning it and developing expertise and uh, pushing forward into the next generation of farming practices. So here the idea is that this is a productive model, but you want to make sure it doesn't get, uh, doesn't lean into romanticized uh, views of farming. All right, so there's a lot more uh, to this research. I hope that this brief tour of some of the mental models of food, farming, and farmers was helpful. You can learn more about what we found and why these models matter for communications in our reports and resources, um, including the next video in this series. I hope you'll keep watching and exploring.